Okay, we'll start with this. Our continued conversation in reference to Karis Artingstall's win this weekend, her latest win, and her latest set of call-outs. She's calling out Sky Nicholson. She's calling out Raven Chapman. In my previous video, we talked about what a Sky Nicholson fight might look like if it were next. Here, let's talk about Raven. Karis Artingstall said, I've boxed the both of them, beat the both of them in the amateurs. The one against Raven was years ago. She's improved. I've improved. It'll be a different fight, more rounds. Etc. Etc. If it were next, I think Karis Artingstall would beat Sky Nicholson. But Raven, Raven is a very different proposition. Raven is more adequately suited for this fight, I think, than Sky Nicholson would be. Raven, like Karis, is a very aggressive fighter. She's not a pure boxer like Sky Nicholson, an outside jabber, outside mover. She's a mid-range to inside fighter, a combination puncher, and a fast one, an athletic one. I would say that Karis Artingstall's best punches are her straight punches, her long-range punches from the outside coming in, whereas Raven's best punches are her bent arm punches, her hooks, her uppercuts, mid-range to inside, in the pocket, Raven is dangerous. And I love her. Raven Chapman is an orthodox fighter, whereas Karis Artingstall, she's a southpaw. I think about the jab of Karis Artingstall and those very strong strike punches, those long range punches from the outside coming in. And then I think about Raven Chapman's head movement and level changes. She knows how to keep that head off center, protect it. Between her head movement and upper body movement, her level changes and her feet, she can make herself a moving target, a tricky target. This fight seems to me to be a pick'em fight, a 50-50 fight, that if this were going to be Karis Artingstall's next fight, I'm not sure she'd beat Raven Chapman. Raven seems a little bit further along to me than Karis, and her quality of competition is certainly better, better. certainly better than Karis Artingstall's so far. Where Karis has that nice knockout win over Vanessa Bradford, who's never been knocked out, Raven Chapman has that win over Jorgelina Guanini, a former champion. And a tough, a very tough tough Argentinian slugger. I've seldom ever seen anybody handle Jorgelina Guanini as easily as Raven Chapman handled her when they fought. Punch for punch, I think Raven is strong, but Karis is a little stronger, just a little stronger. The difference is marginal. Mid-range to inside would favor Raven Chapman, I think, because of those rapid fire combinations, those flurries deep in the pocket. Though at the same time, I wouldn't underestimate Karis Artingstall and what she can do at that range because she steps into a jab. The entirety of a fight, that is where she is trying to be and her opponents often give up ground, give up real estate, move lateral due to her punching power. This seems to me to be a 50-50 fight, a pick'em fight. I do like the straight punches and punching power of Karis Artingstall, but I like the flurries, the fast feet, and rapid fire combinations, the angles of Raven Chapman. You could probably give Raven a slight edge if the fight were next, but I don't think the fight is next. Ben Shalom wants it to be, and he said as much. He wants that to be Karis Artingstall's next fight, though at the same time, Raven has a fight coming up before this year is out. She has a fight coming up against an opponent that has yet to be announced. My honest opinion is this fight won't be Karis Artingstall's next fight because Karis doesn't have anything to offer Raven in terms of a world title or, or money, big money. Is it a big money fight? So what Karis should do if she can't get Raven and she can't get Sky is see if she can't get Nina Menke. Germany's own Nina Menke, who's gonna be in action this weekend opposite the ring Ledesma. If Nina wins that fight, Ben should contact her and see if he can't get her in the ring with Karis. And if they can't get her, what about former IBF champion Sarah Mafood? See if they can't get her in the ring sometime next year. She just fought. Former WBO featherweight champion Heather Hardy. She's still floating around. She hasn't retired. What about her? Ben seems focused on matching his unbeaten fighter against someone else's unbeaten fighter. Well, there's the Sarlin brothers' own Sophia Leash, young prodigy, unbeaten up-and-comer. A lot more fights and a lot more rounds in the bank as a pro than Karis Artingstall. They can see about fighting her. They can see about Germany's own Sarah Liegman. She's got a fight coming up. If she takes care of business, what about matching her against Karis Artingstall? There are options out there. There are plentiful options at featherweight. It's a deep, 
deep division. Karis. No, I don't imagine that either Sky Nicholson or Raven Chapman are going to be next for Karis Artingstall, but the silver lining is there are lots of options at this weight. There's a lot to go around. They can find her somebody, somebody good. They can find her somebody to fight. In men's welterweight news, on the heels of his big win over Alexis Rocha, Giovanni Santillan wants a crack at Mario Barrios next. Mario Barrios, a PBC fighter, interim champion. I don't think he's otherwise preoccupied with anything. Now, with the biggest win of his career under his arm, Santillan, 32 wins, no losses with 17 knockouts, is already looking ahead. I was watching Mario Barrios' fight a few weeks ago. Santillan told a group of reporters, that's a fight. I would like. As Santillan alludes to, Barrios had the performance of his life as he blasted out former champion Jordanis Lugas. Much like Santillan, odds makers were convinced that the former welterweight champion would be a bit too much for Barrios. However, Barrios ignored the dubious voices coming from his critics and went on to win the WBC interim title. That's right, he's WBC interim champion and it's a Montestanionis that has the WBA regular title. In any event, Unless Mario Barrios knows with some certainty when he's going to be fighting and where he's going to be fighting, he should consider a change in decorum. He's been a PBC fighter up until this point, but the PBC don't have a platform right now. How does Al Heyman mean to accommodate all of these fighters? He's got the interim title, so anything that will bring me closer to a world title He's another guy I would love to get in the ring with. I don't know how receptive Marios would be or wouldn't be to a Giovanni Santillan fight, but what I do know is the PBC ain't got a broadcast partner right now. They seem to have two fight dates set out for Las Vegas early next year in February, but you gotta imagine that that's for their high profile fighters like say, Javante Davis or the Spence versus Crawford rematch. High priority fighters high priority fights and I'm not sure that Mario Barrios falls under that category. Mario Barrios, whose trainer, Bob Santos, seems to want to put him in the ring with Errol Spence Jr., the former unified welterweight champion who's en route to fight Terence Crawford for a second time. He's barking up the wrong tree. I think he is. I think that Errol and Terence are on the verge of leaving the welterweight division where Mario campaigns, and if nothing else, they are otherwise preoccupied with each other. Errol ain't got no time for a Mario Barrios right now. So what is Mario gonna do in the meantime? Another big time fight is what the famed trainer wants for his young star at 147 pounds. There are a number of names to choose from. With that said, there's one person in particular that Santos wants to see above all else. I wouldn't mind seeing an all-out shootout with Mario and Errol Spence in Texas, revealed Santos during an interview with 210 Boxing TV. I think that would be great for Texas, and that's not the least bit realistic. If Errol were to stay at welterweight, it's not gonna be for Mario Barrios. They see how easily Terence Crawford handled Errol Spence Jr., and they think to themselves, now is the most opportune time to strike, not realizing you're not Terence Crawford, you guys aren't on the level that he's on, and Errol might actually beat you if you fight him. Just because Terence did that to Errol doesn't mean you can. But that seems to be what Mario Barrios' trainer, Bob Santos, wants. Santos' plans might be too late to become a reality after Spence was handed a violent beatdown at the hands of Terence Crawford earlier this year. He wrote on his Instagram account that he'll campaign at 154 moving forward. By and large, Santos hopes that Spence is being disingenuous. Not only does the longtime trainer want Spence in Texas, but he has the exact venue in mind as well. Errol Spence at the Cowboy Stadium. Do you honestly think you could fill the Cowboy Stadium with today's Errol Spence Jr. and Mario Barrios? Give me a break. Get real. These delusions of grandeur. Bob Santos wants a big fight for his fighter, but with both Errol and Terrence potentially moving up in weight to junior middleweight, they will face a scarcity of big fights at welterweight. I think the biggest name, and that's if if he comes back there, the biggest name at Welter would have to be Conor Ben. That would fast become the only money fight for any and every welterweight at welterweight because the rest of these guys, they don't draw, they don't sell. Mario Barrios, Montestanionis, even Giovanni Santillan off a career best win. He's not a big draw, not yet, but Connor is already there. Connor draws more than Giovanni Santillan, draws more than Alexis Rocha, than Blair Cobbs, than 
Jaron Boots Ennis. Because of his namesake, because of the controversy with Vada, it all lends itself to his profile and his marquee value. So if he does end up returning to 147 pounds, he would literally be the only big money fight for any and every welterweight at welterweight. And we'll see what happens with that because Eddie Hearn has plans of putting him in the ring with Chris Eubank Jr. in the near future. So maybe he don't come back to welterweight. As far as Mario Barrios and Giovanni Santillan's desire to face him, I don't know if that's a fight that Mario is receptive to. If they made it, I would favor Giovanni to win. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking recency bias. You're thinking you're being a slave to the moment because he kicked that guy's ass this past weekend, but that's not what it is. What it is, is that Mario Barrios got knocked out at 140 pounds by a 135 pounder, and he got outpointed by a faded Keith Thurman. So beating a faded Ugas doesn't suddenly make Mario Barrios elite. I'm sorry. The version of Ugas you fought was a guy in his late 30s coming off a loss and over a year of inactivity. That's not the kind of win you shout from the rooftops about. You can't read too much into that. I'd favor Giovanni Santillang to beat that same version of Jordanis Lugas. This is not a case of sour grapes. I literally picked Mario Barrios to win that fight with Lugas on that predication that Ugas is in his late 30s, he's coming off a loss, hasn't fought in over a year, his eye got all messed up in the Spence fight. No, it's not sour grapes. I picked Mario to beat him, and if Mario fought Giovanni, I'd pick Giovanni to beat Mario. Oh. Giovanni's win over Alexis Rocha says more about him than Mario's win over Ugas. Alexis Rocha wasn't some over-the-hill fighter coming off a loss. He was coming off a consecutive wins. He was on a hot streak. He was active. He was young. He wasn't some over-the-hill fighter coming off a loss and inactivity. Giovanni, as the away fighter on a Golden Boy Promotions show, went into Alexis's house and beat the crap out of him there. Took it out of the judge's hands that might have tried to screw him over. That says more to me about Giovanni than Mario's win over Ugas. I would pick Giovanni Santillang to do to Mario Barrios what he just did to Alexis Rocha because Mario, Mario couldn't go the distance with a 135 pounder at 140 and he couldn't beat a faded Keith Thurman. So I don't think he beats a primed, unbeaten Santillang. I think Giovanni dog walks him and stops him. Perhaps that's the reason the fight might not happen. Bob Santos may look at that as a high risk, low reward fight for his fighter. Though if they were to fight, I, I, I'd go with Giovanni. And finally, a recent set of quotes from veteran trainer and former fighter Robert Garcia that state, I believe it's personal between Nacho Beristain and Canelo, personal between Canelo and Nacho, and Nacho's former fighter, former champion Juan Manuel Marquez. All of us here know that Canelo has surpassed Julio Cesar Chavez and any and every other Mexican fighter with what he has achieved in terms of championships and divisions climbed. There are some who are not ready to accept this proposition. Now, as it pertains to Nacho Beristain and Juan Manuel Marquez, this has been going on for years, the shade they've thrown at him. I remember in circa 2015 or 2016, at one point, you know, due to the criticism that he was receiving from Marquez, Canelo proposed that if you think I'm such a bad fighter, why don't you just come up and fight me and prove it? Now, obviously, Marquez didn't take Canelo up on his offer, but you see what I'm getting at, that that's how heated things have become between them over the years, and this has been going on for years. I don't expect it to change. It seems to me that Nacho Beristain and Juan Manuel Marquez view Canelo Alvarez as a somewhat fortunate fighter, very fortunate in some areas, some decisions. I think Marquez scored the Cotto fight for Miguel Cotto, though I'd sooner interpret that as that envy manifesting in another area because all of this reads to me like envy, jealousy, that Juan Manuel Marquez, as accomplished as he is, he's not as accomplished as Canelo Alvarez, not as popular, not as wildly successful, and being honest with you, the same applies to a lot of Mexican fighters in the sense that Canelo Alvarez is arguably the most accomplished and the most successful Mexican fighter Mexico has ever produced. To the point to where you could argue that he has surpassed Julio Cesar Chavez, El Gran Campeón. Some people Some. are not ready to accept that proposition. Nostalgia goggles 
intact. That's what it is. And I'm no young whippersnapper. I grew up watching Chavez fight. I grew up in that era. But I got to tell you that in terms of facts and stats and every quantifiable metric there is, Canelo has already surpassed Chavez. Chavez, like Canelo Alvarez, was a four division champion, but he didn't actually beat as many champions as Canelo Alvarez has across four weight classes. And he was never an undisputed champion. He never held all the alphabet titles at the same time. In terms of quality of competition, there's an argument that Chavez fought a lot of guys that Canelo would never get away with fighting. Guys who were journeymen, guys with negative records and losses in the double digits. Canelo could never get away with fighting guys like that when Chavez fought those guys at the stage of his career that he was in. There, there's an argument there, a credible one. You say that Canelo got a gift in a Golovkin fight, and I'd say, yeah, and Chavez got one in the Whitaker fight, the Sweet Pea fight. I can do this all day, I can, because I've done the research. Moreover, I experienced the Chavez era. Speaking from a first account, I understand that this is a proposition that some are unwilling to accept due to emotional attachment and nostalgia. But as that generation of individuals dies out and the younger one takes over, Canelo will fill the role for them that Chavez filled for the generation before them. And then that proposition may be more widely accepted. It all boils down to preference. It all boils down to nostalgia. On paper, he has already surpassed him. And if nothing else, Canelo Alvarez isn't done yet. He's not retired. He's still adding more victories to his CV, to his legacy. What is fast becoming a hot button topic in many boxing circles, though Canelo Alvarez himself has never stated that he's a greater fighter than his predecessor, that he's a greater fighter than Julio Cesar Chavez. He has always treated sub subjects with earnestness and pride to his Mexican heritage and Mexican boxing culture. So this is something for the fans to argue about. Canelo never said that himself. It's actually Robert Garcia saying that Canelo has surpassed Chavez. It's not as hot a take as some make it out to be. And over time, I see more and more people accepting that proposition that Canelo may very well be the greatest fighter that Mexico ever produced, if nothing else, the most successful and the most accomplished, irrespective of someone's personal nostalgia. Personal feelings. There is a legitimate argument there. There is.